Hi there, I'm Alistair Ben and you're watching Expressive Photography. The sun is shining in the west of Scotland. I'm going to get my Factor 50 ready so I don't get sunburned. Um, and in today's video, we're going to explore why cameras suck. So what I want to try and achieve in today's video, which follows on from last week, where I was really wanting to focus on the experience of being in the landscape and how to be you and how to really get the most out of this year. What I want to start with this is a more sort of an in-depth study of how the world looks, how we see it, how that differs from how our cameras see it, what we can do about it, and to really teach you one brilliant trick that will make your photos suddenly feel much, much more realistic, three-dimensional, have real believable depth. So that's what we're going to try and do today. So in the scene I'm looking at in front of me, and, and this isn't about making a great photograph, it's to explain the concept. I can see with my two, two eyes, we've got this little uh, mound on the front right-hand corner there with this beautiful rock covered in lichen and heather and stuff like that. And then the, the scene recedes through the mid-ground, drops down into the bottom of the glen there, and then we can see the loch and the distant hills and the clouds over the top of them. It's very clear to me, stood here, that there is significant depth in there. I'm looking across a scene probably of about four to five kilometres or more, maybe even uh, eight or ten kilometres to the horizon over there. What is it about this scene that allows me to understand depth? One of the first things that we have to appreciate is that there's a transition. There's a transition that goes from the front to the back of detail. I can see every little tuft of the heather. I can see all the little details and grains of that rock in the foreground where it's catching the sunlight there. And as I, my, my eyes move through the frame, I see progressively less detail and less sharpness. Right through to the far hills at the back there, where I can hardly see any detail at all, just broad brush strokes of colour and maybe a little bit of dappling of slightly different tones. So that's the first thing we notice about landscapes, is that we perceive depth because of transitions, transitions of detail, transitions of contrast, can, transitions of um, proximity. We feel that depth because of these transitions. The second thing that our eyes are incredibly brilliant at doing is um, perceiving differences in luminosity. In front of me here, I can look at uh, that rocky scene um, and see into the shadows. And as I stare into them, my pupils open up and I can see deeper into those shadows, showing me details. As my eyes lift, I see the clouds in front of me or even behind Anne Christine there, the sun is rising behind the clouds. And if I look into that brighter area, I can see lots of details in the highlights. But I realise that the foreground becomes darker as my eyes, as my pupil gets narrower. I see more in the details, but the foreground gets darker as I'm, con as I'm uh, making that adjustment. This variable aperture of our eye is our best friend in terms of how we perceive the world. Cameras don't see like that, and this is why occasionally we need something like this, which is a, a graduated neutral density filter. And if I record the scene now in front of me again, 
and I just drop. We can see here that the foreground is um, reasonably exposed and the, the background is starting to get quite bright. That's the difference in dynamic range that, that I'm experiencing in this scene. And if I just drop this magnetic, uh, oops, turn it the right way around. If I just drop this magnetic neutral density filter there, you can see that I've managed to bring down the exposure of the sky so that the foreground and the background somehow feel a little bit more balanced. These are the tricks that we have to do with our cameras to control the dynamic range in scenes. So what this video is really all about is to understand that cameras don't see the world the same way that we do. We have this incredible sensory system and it's up to us to explore our sensory system, to experience the world in a 3D super sensory way, understand the limitations of this really quite high-end camera so that we have to control the scene to translate that into something that's aesthetic or, or makes sense to a viewer. And as soon as I point my camera into the sun, the more extreme that dynamic range problem gets. We have a totally blown out sky. The foreground um, is sort of somewhat exposed, but there's bits of flare. The light is bouncing around inside the lens, creating all sorts of problems. If we want to make these types of photographs, we have to employ a whole plethora of ridiculous techniques to try and do that. I've got a a four-stop reverse graduated filter on this piece of video that you can see here. The sky is still completely blown out and if I try to control those highlights you can see that even taking it down, I've got to take it down to 1 over 1,600 or 1,600 of a second uh, to try and control that sky whereas the actual foreground may be a 30th of a second. I'm going to have to do something ridiculous to try and control that. If however I switch out to a long lens, and this is the Nikon 80-400, to I'm still pointing directly into the sun, but the sun's no longer in the frame. But the same principles apply. We can see layers of mountainside there receding into this very hazy uh, area, which is across the other side of the glen. The transitions of detail move through the frame and we can see layer upon layer upon layer that shows right here in the film in front of us that we have depth. The trick is when we get into Lightroom is what we can do to emphasize that and to make it feel as if we're getting that real sense of depth in our photographs. One thing is certainly true here that the more uh, dynamic range we have to deal with it's certainly the case that the camera struggles more and more with that. I think we really take for granted just how incredible our eyesight can be as we look across the landscape and feel it with not just our eyesight but with all five senses and I think that relationship with the landscape is the first step to making better photographs is to just really immerse yourself and understand how you perceive the landscape, what it is in the landscape that's catching your attention and drawing you in. And then of course, realizing that there are limitations to the tool that we have, regardless of how good they are, there are limitations to this tool that are going to make it harder and harder for us to put these uh, engagements across to a third party without increasingly large amounts of technique. So I think it's a good idea to start with simpler scenes with less dynamic range, learn how to control those and to introduce good believable depth and three-dimensionality and then progress up to increasingly more complex scenes. Of course, if we try to run uh, a marathon before we can even walk 20 metres, we're obviously going to stumble and fall very, very quickly. So I think we need to train ourselves to broaden our technical, emotional and experiential palette and that way we're going to make better photographs as we move through 2022. Let's dive back to the studio now and uh, see what we can do with these raw files to bring them to life and to make them feel a little bit more believable. Hi everyone, we're back now in the studio. Hat buff still on because it's uh, the house is a wee bit cold. Uh, the first thing that's immediately obvious to me when I come back inside is that I'm no longer outside. 
And that may seem a very obvious and somewhat trivial statement. However, when I'm outside, you have the broad horizon in front of you. There's the wind, there's you know, the grass moving, there's that sort of being out there in the landscape and feeling out there and feeling somewhat free. Uh, now I'm back in my office, the walls are closing in and I feel that sort of, uh, not claustrophobia particularly, but I spend a lot of time in this office so my brain kind of switches into a very different mode. And what I want to try and do in this session is to look at, first of all, the scene uh, from the wide video clip there looking down the glen and explaining the one secret that changes everything about how we can process and how we can deliver authenticity in our landscapes. And in this video, it's not about making incredible photographs, it's about explaining a concept. But the first thing is that I, when, we're, when we're back in the, in the studio or when we're back in our offices, all of a sudden you've lost that connection with the world outside. And that's why it's so important that when we are in the landscape, that we look and feel and see and perceive and receive information that tells us all the signals that we need to come into the studio and remember what the world looks like, feels like, because that's what we need. Otherwise, we just come in and start moving sliders around to create something that looks okay. But at the same time with the landscape, we have to appreciate how that landscape feels. And we can create aesthetics that look ugly and um, challenging to other people who may have a very highly tuned sense of what the world looks like outside. So without any further ado, because I'm, I'm, otherwise I'm just gonna wobble away. This is the wide scene, nice and straightforward. It's not, you know, I'm not here to make a great photograph. This is just what we're looking at to explain the concept. Now, if I pull this into the develop module, I'll just shut that side window to make the image a little bit bigger. Now I used my reverse graduated neutral density filter here. I had my case armor system on the new magnetic system and I had my reverse grad that came down and darkened the sky. So I've, first of all, I had to make a technical decision in the landscape to control the dynamic range. It would have been possible, I think, without, but just to make it nice and easy here, let's stick with this. In the second half of the studio version, we're gonna look at an image where the dynamic range was too great. So here we are, the, we've got, we can see there are triggers already. There's something telling us this is closer than that. And the one thing that works in photography better than anything else to give you that perception of depth is the value of your blacks. In painting, they call it the transition of blacks. And it's a very well-known thing that you have the darkest blacks in the foreground. And then as you recede into the depth of the frame, they, they become less black and more shadow and then ultimately mid-tone. And you can see that here. If I hit the J key on my uh, Apple, Apple Mac, um, you can see I have a tiny bit of clipping in the foreground here. This is telling you that the deepest blacks are in the foreground, which is where you would expect them to be, underneath a rock, deep underneath the heather. And if I pull my black slider down, you will see where we're going to clip first, we can see the band at the bottom and then watch that top left hand, uh, the corner here, this, this section here, that is the next area to clip because that's the next furthest thing out. The next areas are up on the right hand side, which is the next band. So that is telling you as we darken our blacks that we get a progression of darkening of those blacks that moves out away from the foreground and into the background. So let's start with that, which is the blacks down at minus 100. How far do I have to keep darkening? Okay, so that top right hand side there, that's the, the reverse graduated filter has unnaturally darkened the cloud so that it no longer retains its tonal relationship. So that's fine. But in terms of the landscape there, we have not yet, if we ignore that top cloud there, 
how far do we have to go? There we go. We start to bring in shadows when we're massively, massively underexposed. Uh, the blacks. We start clipping the blacks when we're massively underexposed. So at the end of the day, the clue is already in the file. Now, we have to be careful about our blacks, you know, less so for web posting. Having deep clip blacks isn't a big problem for web posting, but in terms of printing, we have to be much more mindful of that. And perhaps in a future video, I would show how to deal with a print when I finally get back to printing in the summer. Um, but yeah, so for now we've got a tiny bit of clipping in there and it's just nice and easy to lift the blacks so that they're no longer clipped. We have here a somewhat natural dynamic range. Now this is how I experienced it and I had to use the graduated filter to recreate that. The, the, if we deal with, uh, if we deal with our blacks as the, the key trigger, the key transition, from foreground through to background, the second is detail, clarity, and texture. So if I just grab a linear gradient here and just pull that up, there already exists a texture and detail gradient. We can see more detail in the foreground than we can in the background, but giving nature a helping hand, add a bit of clarity and detail and we are going to start clipping the blacks again purely because the clarity slider is affecting contrast. It is deepening the blacks and raising the whites. But if I add presence, you know, luminosity, some contrast, some texture, I'll even just use the contrast slider there just to, to give it there. If I turn that off and on, you can see without, we do have the transition, we have more detail in the front than we have in the back, but if I give it a bit of a helping hand, all of a sudden the foreground comes to life, it becomes more engaging, feels closer, feels more tactile, feels as if we're standing there. Equally, we can take a second slider down from the top and do the opposite. We can, a little bit of negative dehaze we can still brighten that a fraction as well. But if we add, take a bit, you know, so taking a bit of contrast away, also we can cool things which make them feel further away. And that's also introducing a second transition from warmer foreground to cooler background. The transitions will always help us travel through the frame. But you can definitely see here that we have, um, we have more detail, deeper blacks in the foreground, less detail, uh, more raised open shadows in the background. This transition of blacks is the single most important thing landscape photographers need to know about how the world looks, period. <laughs> go out into the woods, go out into the mountains, go out along the, the, the ocean shore, anywhere that's close where you can see the horizon and look at the transition of blacks that's present in the landscape. For the second half of this video, I just want to look at a very quick uh, HDR blend and then how to overcome some of the shortcomings uh, that that produces to, to overcome uh, having to use a graduated filter. So in these three selected files here, I took three different exposures. Now I actually had the, it's a four stop reverse graduated neutral, neutral density filter. So I was already darkening the sky. The difference between the sky and the foreground exposure was huge in this case. So I've taken three exposures. The last one here, you can see we've lost all that detail round about where the sun was kissing those clouds there. And what I wanted to try and do is create a single file that has all of that detail plus uh, an exposed foreground. The easiest way to do that is to select those three images and go Photo Merge HDR. And by clicking that, it creates a single 32-bit file, which has this massive dynamic range, and this is what it produced. And with the auto settings, it already looks pretty good. But what we can see here 
is we have clipping along that horizon edge there as well as in the foreground. I expect them in the foreground. I know that the ones along the horizon edge there are caused by this very heavy reverse graduated filter. Reverse graduated filters are clean in the bottom and then very dark and then they diffuse up. And what that does is it creates um, uh, the darkening along the horizon, which is at sunrise or sunset, typically where the brightest bit of sky is. So what I want to do is I just want to balance this thing out. Uh, now, there have been some auto settings applied to this already, uh, not horribly aggressively, but somewhat aggressively. So what I'll do is I'm just going to balance out some of that uh, and then do a very quick process. Now, it may well be that a single uh, brush here may be enough for me to just raise the blacks. I'm just using a roller mouse here. Um, I've been starting to use a tablet again. Um, I've been doing so much processing for another project that I've actually uh, hurt my hand and my forearm. I've almost got a repetitive strain injury here. Um, so I've started using a new uh, tablet and pen. Um, so when I'm doing my, my proper processing now, I'm actually using this, but I'm just using my, um, my roller mouse uh, today for this process. So what that's done is that's helped with the clipping. And then I think I'm just going to add a second linear gradient here, hold down the shift key, and I'm just going to open up the blacks at the top to make the sky a little bit less heavy and oppressive. And then I will do my usual linear gradient from the bottom. And I just want to add a bit of that clarity and luminosity back in. Now, one final thing I want to address in this particular video is the brightness of the reflection of the water. It's a myth, or it's not a myth per se, but it, it's the where you look into a reflection isn't always reflecting the thing that it is reflecting, if that makes sense. You're, so we're not seeing we're not seeing the sun in the sky here. We can see some quite nice warm clouds in here, but this bit of sky is actually reflecting something that is bright above us, which is this area above the clouds. Um, so it's not always the case that you can't have a bright, rich uh, foreground piece of water like that. What I am going to do, I think, uh, just with another brush, is I'm just going to cool some of that water just to introduce a nice bit of color contrast again, just to sort of get a bit of that cooler uh, reflection of the sky there and maybe take a little bit of the heat out of it. Um, what I'll do is I'll finish processing this image in my own time and then we'll show it at the end of the video. So the take home that I would like you to get from today's video is how we experience the world tells us uh, gives us a lot of clues and triggers for how we're going to process our images and how we're going to present them to other people. The transition of blacks is probably the single most important thing you need to remember when processing your images. If you have things above the horizon or in the distance that are unnaturally dark and you have more so than the foreground in even light, it's going to feel weird. Um, and I think it's, it's a barrier between people enjoying your photographs and just feeling a bit uneasy with your photographs. As I said, I didn't come out this morning trying to make pretty gorgeous photographs. I was only trying to emphasize and demonstrate this point of depth and transitions in the landscape with a little bit of blending thrown in as well. Thank you very much for watching. Please hit the subscribe button and give me a thumbs up and like. Any comments are always appreciated as well. Um, and yeah, we will uh, we'll dig into some more of this in the future. I'm actually away uh, next week for about 10 days um, on a photo trip. So there probably will not be any videos for the next couple of weeks, but I am going to be making some while I'm away. So take care wherever you are. Keep safe and happy and creative. And I look forward to talking to you again very, very soon um, and bringing you some more expressive photography and some of these little tips to try and help your photography in 2022. But remember, cameras do kind of suck. Bye for now.